Welcome to a presentation on the Great Ice Storm of 2.22.22. Before we get started, I'd like to thank uh, the folks and organizations on your screen for their help in sending in pictures, articles, and other information on the Great Ice Storm. Without their help, this would not have been possible, so thank you. The Great Ice Storm of 2.22.22 might have been forgotten except for its unique date as well as the fact that people had cameras and took pictures of the storm after it abated. And it was indeed pictures like these of Baraboo that caught my attention years ago and prompted this presentation a hundred years after the event. And it became quickly apparent doing research that this was not just a local event but was a regional event across five different states. Indeed, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, as well as Iowa and Illinois were all affected by this massive storm. Now, even before the ice storm happened on Wednesday, the 22nd of February, 1922, the month was shaping up to be a weird and record-breaking month. The weekend before the Great Ice Storm, a thunderstorm swept across parts of southern Wisconsin on Sunday morning, February 19th, with heavy rain reported in places like Baraboo and Reedsburg. The exceedingly rare thunderstorm was heard in places ranging from Madison to Sparta and over to Oshkosh in Winnebago County, where lightning struck the barn of Edward Uvas and killed six of his cows, a calf, and a horse. In Middleton, wind from the storm blew down part of an automobile garage and hail was reported along with icy streets and sidewalks. The Barber Weekly News reported the old saying that six months after the first thunderstorm there will be a frost and this will bring the event about on August 19th. The Janesville Daily Gazette had a different prognostication reporting that old timers declare that an electrical storm in February denotes the breaking up of winter. They could not have been more wrong. On Tuesday afternoon, February 21st, rain began falling again across southern Wisconsin accompanied by thunder and lightning bringing a storm that would not quit. About 10 p.m. that evening, the steeple of St. Patrick's Catholic Church in Sparta was struck by a bolt of lightning and started on fire. Firefighting efforts were hampered by the wind which carried the stream of water away before it could even get high enough to reach the flames. The fire consumed the steeple before it was low enough to be put out. Rain continued overnight and all day on February 22nd. Because of the frozen ground, the water had nowhere to go, and even though less than an inch and a half of rain fell, the amount was still a record for February in many locations and created record flooding. As the storm moved north, things began to freeze. Where you were made all the difference as to the experience you would have over the next 24 to 72 hours. As rain fell across southern Wisconsin, streams and rivers rose quickly. The Mississippi River at Cassville rose 8 feet in 24 hours. Wood piles, fences, and chickens were swept away. Livestock Livestock caught out in fields sought higher ground and then sometimes got swept away as well. Flooding was reported all across southern Wisconsin, all the way up to places like La Crosse and clear over to Sheboygan. Cities and villages across central Wisconsin had neighborhoods submerged along with isolated basements. In Platteville, the basement of Mrs. Selena Bottoms was flooded and had her provisions floating all around its surface. High water threatened dams and bridges in many locations. At Muscaday, the power dam was washed out, plunging the village into darkness. Flooding also created a new problem on already frozen waterways covered with thick ice. Ice-covered rivers would flood, then rise and break the ice into large pieces which would float around, knocking into things or creating ice dams, further exacerbating the flooding. Ice jams threatened bridges in multiple cities and villages. In La Crosse, dynamite was used to blow up ice jams that were threatening several bridges in the city. 
Explosive experts from a nearby stone quarry were called in to do the job and worked into the wee hours of the morning to loosen the ice. Even after floodwaters receded, the ice cakes were still a problem in many locations, however. In Darlington, receding waters left pieces of ice in one man's yard that were 6 by 15 feet and 2 and a half feet thick. Richland Center was particularly hard hit by flooding. During the afternoon of February 22nd, authorities in Richland Center started getting telephone calls warning them of flooding and high water upstream on the Pine River. Warnings and recommendations to move were made to residents in low-lying areas, particularly those next to the mill pond on the west edge of the city. Many people, however, did not heed the warning either because they did not believe it or because they had nowhere to go. A few hours later, however, the officials were proved right. Water started rising in the early evening hours and by nightfall, 25 blocks of Richland Center were flooded. Making the problem worse was the ice that had been on the mill pond. Acres of ice, anywhere from 10 to 30 inches, were lifted up by the rising water, broken into pieces, and carried downstream through the city. Much of it piled up against the footbridge, which across the middle of the mill pond. The thunderous roar of the ice breaking up and piling up was not soon forgotten by those who heard it. Residents who hadn't fled were rescued in the dark by truck, car, horse and wagon, and boat as massive chunks of ice floated through neighborhoods bumping into houses and trees. Over 100 people were sheltered at the city auditorium building while others stayed with friends and family. A cow was also reportedly rescued by rowboat. One woman that couldn't be moved was a mother who had just given birth two days earlier. When the floodwaters neared her bed on the first floor, she was simply moved upstairs. Fortunately, the water receded about as fast as it had risen, but in its wake it left homes filled with mud and ice. Giant cakes of ice some 18 inches thick laid in the streets until spring. One resident, Glenn Berry, took advantage of the situation and built an ice house in his yard and filled it with ice laying around. Flooding in many areas of Richland Center was eased some when temperatures dropped and the rain turned to snow. In areas like Richland Center and other communities in valleys in the Driftless region, the storm affected you based upon your elevation. At Lafarge, the paper later reported, while we in the valley were having floods, those on the ridges were suffering loss from a different source. The temperature held at the freezing point, and the rain froze on everything until great trees were stripped of their branches under the enormous weight of ice. In nearby Viola, the situation was similar, as the Viola News reported, we in the valleys were not affected by the ice storm as the temperature was higher in the valley and the rain did not freeze. Not a tree was hurt and no wires were down in town. So temperature made all the difference in the world. The Reedsburg Free Press reported, the rain began Tuesday afternoon, the storm being accompanied by much thunder and lightning. When it, did, when it did not rain hard, it came as a sizzling, misty, drizzly storm, and as the thermometer was several degrees below freezing, it was not long until the trees, wires, and everything exposed was covered with its load of ice. By Wednesday evening, the ice was more than an inch thick on cement sidewalks in the city of Reedsburg. The temperature on February 22nd was about 30 degrees above zero in the icebound district at noon and continued at that point all day. At the point of the clouds, it must have been above freezing for the moisture fell in the form of rain only to freeze simultaneously with its descent. The damage began to be felt about noon, February 22nd, when telephone and telegraph poles began to pull, and by night practically every telephone, electric light circuit, and power transmission plant was absolutely down and out of commission, while there was not a thoroughfare, yard, or grove in which trees were not down or with their branches so broken as to be almost bare trunks. Absolute isolation and darkness was the result. Families having lamps and kerosene oil were fortunate, while the persons who could not reach stores where, where candles could be bought soon exhausted the supply. 
So said the Lacrosse Tribune. The ice in Appleton was followed by blizzard conditions. The further north one went, the less ice there was, with the storm changing from rain to all snow. Green Bay fared better than some cities with no major loss of power. Telephone service was only marginally affected. The snow came with its own problems, though, albeit somewhat more routine. Eau Claire saw more than a foot of snow after the sleet. Bad drifts occur which left streets and roads impassable. Snow in Superior was reported at 32 inches, with 45 mile per hour winds causing drifts 21 feet in height. Duluth was buried in snow. Drifts were reported to be higher than trolley wires and houses. In Phillips, a reported 15 inches of snow fell, but this was added to 30 inches already on the ground. Price County Highway Commissioner Ben Griffin was for the first time able to try out his new snow plowing contraption, a Holt 10-ton Caterpillar tractor with an enormous blade on the front. Members of the National Guard in Duluth from the Tank Corps fired up their tanks and took to the streets to help break snow drifts and clear the roads. While the, form, while the storm affected all of Wisconsin, the damage in the south from flooding and deep snow in the north were more typical than the ice which spread across the middle of the state from La Crosse to Lake Winnebago and from Baraboo to Wausau. The damage was surreal. Lillian Case, a student at Lawrence College in Appleton, experienced the storm and wrote about it to her parents in Racine. You should, have, you should see this place don't know whether you experienced weather like this or not. If you did not, you ought to come to Appleton. It is worth the price of a ticket three times over to view the town. You could not get here by foot, by train, automobile, or horse-drawn vehicle, so I guess you would have to fly, surely the only safe way. You cannot imagine what the site is. The storm seems to have centered right here in Appleton. Several days there had been thunder and snowstorms, and then thunder, lightning, rain, hail, and heavy snow all in one night. It was so strange I watched it most of the night not able to sleep owing to the noise. It did not seem real to see the lightning and hear thunder, and at the same time a real honest-to-goodness snowstorm in process. Well, you should have seen the result. I cannot describe it. No one could. Sidewalks were filled with icy slush more than ankle-deep everywhere. The trees were literally loaded with tons of ice, and the destruction you should see it. Every minute there are crashes like explosions as great branches break and fall from trees. Many of the large-sized trees have bent over and snapped off in the middle by the weight of the ice. Oh, how can I describe it? I cannot believe it is true. Even when I look out my window and see the great branches snapping off and the trees bending over. Damage to trees was probably the most striking damage and what affected people's psyche the most, from the sound to the sight. On every sound could be heard the cracking of limbs, the crack of trees as they split open and the roar of the trees as they hit the ground with a thud, reported the Viola News. The Bearber Weekly News described the sound on 222. On Wednesday night, the town sounded as if it were being bombarded in time of war. Trees were cracking and breaking on every hand. The courthouse square in Berber was much affected and even time stood still when the courthouse clock stopped working due to ice buildup on the hands of the clock. Not only did the damage to the trees sound like war, the next morning it looked like war. Destruction was likened to World War I. Headlines in Green Bay likened the damage to the Great War. The Jackson County Journal in Black River Falls stated, One of the overseas soldiers made the remark that the woods here now look like the same as the woods in France that were riddled with shell fire. Damage was also likened to that of a, of, of a tornado or cyclone. Worse than a tornado was the headline at the Reedsburg Free Press. George Lutz described the scene. 
The timber loss, to say the least, will take 50 years to regrow. For miles and miles, it all represents the weeping willow in shape. To those not seeing this site, one can hardly realize the enormous loss in dollars. In an effort to salvage valuable trees, newspaper articles were printed with advice on how to prune and reinforce trees. Trees meant not just natural forests and woodlots, but also orchards. The Green Bay Press Gazette reported, orchards looked like a symmetrical arrangement of sticks in the snow. Nothing was left of the fruit trees but the trunks. Bushes and shrubberies appeared as though frozen in solid round cakes of ice. Manitowoc, Sheboygan, and Sauk counties, the state's second, third, and fourth largest apple producers, respectively, were hard hit. Near Baraboo, the sky-high apple orchard had a number of its older trees ruined, but it was hoped that the younger trees, which were more supple, fared better. A full week after the storm, the Baraboo Weekly News reported that the trees were still coated with an inch of ice, and it could not be determined if the buds were hurt. One piece of good news was that the abundant orchards in Door County, the state's most productive apple growing region, narrowly missed the ice part of the storm and therefore avoided much of the damage found in the rest of the state. Besides commercial orchards, most farms had a personal or production orchard of some size. Many were ruined. One farmer from north of Reedsburg reported that the loss just in his orchard would exceed $3,000, or about $50,000 in 2022. The thick ice affected farm fields as well as smothering winter crops such as winter wheat, rye, clover, and alfalfa. Winter grains were hit hard by the sleet storm. Farmers were advised to disc their fields to break through the crust of ice and allow the crops to breathe. The thick coating of ice across the middle of the state also had an adverse effect on wildlife. The ice made it impossible for birds and other animals to forage beneath the snow to find food or even eat buds on trees covered in ice. Among the forest birds, there is much suffering and death by starvation, wrote the Reedsburg Free Press. Partridges come to the roads in search of food, and no doubt most of them will perish while other winter birds have disappeared by starvation or migrated southward, their food supply, supply being covered with ice. The State Conservation Commission urged farmers and residents to put out feed for birds and wild animals. In Fond du Lac, hundreds of wild rabbits invaded the city looking for food. Aquatic wildlife was also found in unusual places. In Darlington, a three-pound carp was caught on Main Street where floodwaters reached a foot higher than ever before. One of the most significant effects for humans as a result of the storm was the loss of communication that it created. Telegraph and telephone lines were destroyed, cutting off information from near and far. Locally, many newspapers could not be printed without electricity. Many communities had no idea of the extent or severity of the storm for days. One report estimated that over 15,000 utility poles were broken and 1,000 miles of wire were down. George Lutz described the damage. For nearly a hundred miles, it is nothing but ice, ice, ice. Thousands of telegraph and telephone poles are broken off all the way from the ground up to within a foot from the top of the poles. The wires are broken and tangled up in hundreds of places. In some localities, I noticed wires submerged under the ice which came after the rain. The leader telegram in Eau Claire reported, the breaking of the wires and poles came about in this way, according to an official of the telephone company. The rain and sleet kept freezing to the wires until they were as thick as pitchfork handles. Then a bunch of wires would break under the weight of the ice, and the weight of the iced wires on the other side of the pole would become such that it snaps the pole in two. The Saw County News reported one pole breaking caused others to snap, one falling after the others like a row of dominoes. Some idea of the weight of the ice was found when a coated piece of wire two feet long was found to weigh four pounds. This would make a ton of ice to each wire between two poles. 
telephone service in the northern part of the state where there was only snow was less affected. In Nina, a temporary wireless telegram was set up in the loft of the Bergstrom Paper Company by brothers Bill and Cornelius Quinn. The Quinns operated a special licensed radio in the back room of their restaurant, which was swamped with stranded railroad passengers. The Quinns were able to send and receive Morse code from station WMV in Manitowoc, and they worked tirelessly for several days, each rotating four-hour shifts. Three ham radio operators in Appleton relayed information they monitored on the airwaves to the local newspaper. Others in Oshkosh, Menasha, and Kakana did the same thing. On the edge of the storm, zone telegraph circuits were rerouted thousands of miles to connect with cities only a few hundred miles away. After the connection between Chicago and St. Paul was lost, a distance of 400 miles, telegraphs were sent from Chicago to New York, then to Toronto, west to Winnipeg, and then back down into St. Paul. Many newspapers were hampered by loss of electricity. Some used hand presses. The Nina Daily News issued a four-page paper that was only six by nine inches, using an old-fashioned foot press. In Baerbu, where two competing newspapers were to be found, power went out before the Baerbu Daily News was finished printing. The Baerbu Daily Republic was still running off of electric electricity generated by local water power and kindly printed the news in a gesture of camaraderie. Besides losing typical means of communication, residents of central Wisconsin also found it hard to navigate in more ways than one. During and after the storm, it was dangerous to be outside due to falling branches, poles, wires, and ice, especially at night. In Appleton, residents that still had power were asked to keep their porch lights on or to put out kerosene lamps to supply light for people who had to be out when the city's street light system had failed. Trees clogged roads and downed power lines could still be hot. In Oshkosh, a team of horses was killed when they ran into dangling trolley wires that were still energized. The driver escaped unhurt. A milkman in Nina lost his team of horses when they came into contact with a live wire. Those hunkered down inside dealt with loss of electricity for a few hours, several days, or even weeks. Power was cut off by snapped wires and remaining grids were shut down to prevent accidents and to allow for repairs. Municipal water supplies hampered by loss of electricity to pumps. Oshkosh water pressure diminished to the point that no water was available above the first floor level. Apartment dwellers from the second floor up had to carry their water with them. Water mains also burst in Oshkosh and parts of other cities. Some people also had a hard time getting out of their house even if they wanted to. In Oshkosh, the Green Bay Press Gazette reported, doorways and windows were covered with a solid two inches of ice. Some people were forced to crawl out of cellar windows which were partly protected and chop their way into their front doors. Many houses had windows broken by falling trees, a chimney knocked off, or other damage. In Nina, the telegraph operator at the Sioux Line Depot heard the roof caving in after several telephone poles had fallen on it and dove through the nearest window right before debris showered on his desk. Needless to say, thousands of school children were gleefully delighted as schools closed, although with much, a much higher threshold than today. School children in Winslow, Illinois, where the water on the Pecatonica River reached its second highest crest, were simply taken by boat to and from school. Other children skated to school. In southern Minnesota, some ice-covered highways were as smooth as glass, and eight high school students reportedly skated eight miles on the public highways. Schools in much of the Fox River Valley closed for three days and reopened on the Monday after the storm, but with limitations and precautions. It was reported that the schools are now open again, but no evening meetings of any kind are held. Even the basketball, basketball games are postponed, the most eloquent proof of a real plight. 
In the school grounds, lines of sand have been placed around the buildings and the children are warned not to cross them because of the danger of falling icicles from the roof. Those that didn't have to go to school found conditions unparalleled for skating and sliding. In Prairie du Chien, a 40-acre lake was created when part of the first ward was flooded up to six feet deep. After it froze over, skaters could easily glide over submerged fences. Working conditions were also hampered for those that could even get to work. The island woolen mill in Baraboo had to shut down operations in several departments due to flooding in the boiler room. Many other mills and factories across central Wisconsin were shut down by the lack of power or the lack of coal. Some resorted to other methods of power machinery like using the power takeoff from a gasoline powered tractor. For most people across Wisconsin, mail was delayed either coming or going for several days, although not for lack of trying. One mailman, Ted Bray, in La Crosse resorted to using skis. Washburn did not receive any mail for a week, with the Omaha Railroad unable to clear the path. Many mail was about to be delivered by dog sled when the first train finally made it through. When the mail finally did arrive, over 200 sacks arrived weighing well over four tons altogether. Funerals were also delayed. As many as 14 bodies in Green Bay waited to be laid to rest until the road to the cemetery could be opened. Many undertakers never remembered a time when funerals were postponed due to weather conditions. Supply chains were also affected. Supplies ran low in some cities and villages. No trains reached Washburn for a week due to the heavy snow and provisions started to become scarce. Milk was rationed to the children who desperately needed it. Stores had runs on axes, pickaxes, and shovels. Lamps and candles ran out, even though the price of candles sometimes jumped from 30 cents to a dozen to 90 cents. Sandwiches were fetching 25 cents a piece in some markets. Besides price gouging, though, other crime was down. No holdups or robberies were reported in Appleton for several days. Transportation by most means uh, was, was difficult at best. With trees, branches, and poles and wires down, everywhere roads became impassable and railroads, cross-country and interurban, were shut down. Most people that were home stayed home, while those that were far from home often tried any means possible to get there. A group of six men from Green Bay stranded in Fond du Lac reached Oshkosh only after using a taxi cab, which they often had to push for miles on ice and mud-covered roads. At Oshkosh, they eventually persuaded another cab driver to take them on Lake Winnebago to Nina despite the risk of break-ins, the ice being concealed by heavy layer of slush. Another cab, which they also had to push, got them from Nina to Appleton, where the interurban line was up and running and got them to Kakana. From there, a farmer boy was found to take them to De Pere by sleigh. From De Pere, the bus line was up and running and took them to Green Bay. The whole trip, which normally took only a few hours, took two days. In 1922, Wisconsin had over 7,500 miles of railroad in operation, more than three times the mileage today. Railroads were the lifeline for many communities and provided transportation and freight. Throughout the storm and afterwards, the state railroads faced flooding, ice-covered tracks, heavy snow, and more, most importantly, the lack of vital communications with telegraph and telephone lines down. Flooding in the south inundated tracks up to f with up to five feet of water. High water in Richland County took out a railroad bridge between Lone Rock and Richland Center, delaying all trains for 24 hours. Bridges near Calamine and Blue River were also washed away. As the storm raged, some trains slowed and some were delayed for hours. Others never made it to their destination. Just nine miles outside of Nina, 80 passengers were stranded when their train, pulled by two locomotives, derailed, fortunately leaving the passenger cars on the tracks. 
Temporary tracks were then built around the wreck and another engine was hooked up, but it too went into the ditch. After more temporary track was built, a fourth engine was hooked up and this time it was successful. The passengers had been stuck on the coach for over 40 hours, most with little to eat for over 30 hours. Thankfully, heat was not a problem. Passengers lucky enough to be at depots were often forced to stay at them for days if they could not find accommodations elsewhere. Hotels quickly filled to capacity with cots lining hallways. Many passengers also had limited funds, not realizing they would not be home for days when they left. The Capital Times reported, When a train comes in, it's literally mobbed in the mad rush of people to get on. Police and train officials are powerless and none are able to get off the train until the rush of getting on is over. Eight railroad wrecks were reported within a 30-mile radius of Appleton. Besides the Nina-bound Sioux Line, one of the worst accidents was near Little Chute when two engines pulling passenger train 216 went off the tracks. A switch in the track became clogged with snow and ice, and when the engines passed over it, the first engine went one way and the second engine went the other, both ending up in the ditch after tearing up about 500 feet of track. Fortunately, the passenger cars stayed on the tracks. One engineer and two firemen, however, were injured during the wreck. When a work train filled with three more engines showed up to retrieve the two engines, they also derailed for a total of five engines now in the ditch. A cold wave followed the storm with temperatures well below freezing, making working conditions extremely brutal. Sun shone occasionally, but temperatures hovered just a few degrees above zero. Normal railroad snow plows were useless against the ice. The only way to clear the tracks was with massive manual labor involving men with pickaxes and shovels. One group of 150 men in the Fox River Valley reportedly cleared nine miles in temperatures around zero degrees. Frederick Castle, a veteran conductor with one of the railroads coming out of Oshkosh, told the newspaper, I have been running a railroad train in Wisconsin 54 years, and I have never known anything like this before. We tried to get through from Oshkosh Thursday. We started out with an engine and a caboose ahead of a passenger loaded with shovelers at about 8 o'clock in the morning, and by 1 o'clock the men had literally chopped the ice from the tracks, so we reached Fitzgerald's six miles from Oshkosh. When rail lines were cleared, railroad operations faced another challenge trying to operate without communication. Madison reported that trains on all lines in the devastated country are running without wire control still and simply have to run as best they can on schedules and wait at stations for until the train from the opposite direction passes them. The Capital Times reported, there being no wire service, each train brought its orders and had to feel its way to avoid collisions and accidents. The Sioux Line instituted the underground system of dispatching trains in geographic areas known as blocks. During certain hours of the day and night, traffic moved in a checkerboard fashion through the blocks. Then at a certain time, all trains were held for traffic in the other direction. The first train through a block carried with its orders from the dispatcher that showed how many trains were being let through. The dispatcher at the other end with this information at hand then knew when the block was cleared and could send trains through the other way with the same kind of information on the first train. Thus the service continued with an it's your move next, slower by far than dispatching by wire but just as safe and brought an end to the tie-up that caused when trains failed to report. Though the devastation was awful, it was also often sublimely beautiful. Those with Kodak cameras rushed to take photos and caused film to become scarce in some stores. Those with an entrepreneurial bent made real photo postcards like this one of the Al Ringling Mansion in Baraboo and offered them for sale. In Nina and Oshkosh, motion picture companies from out east came to take pictures for newsreels. 
Everywhere one looked was an ice-covered wonderland, from the bazaar to the beautiful. The Viola News reported, woven wire fences along the road were frozen so full of ice that they looked like a sheet of ice hanging up between the posts. A.N. Lacombe, a superintendent for Chicago and Northwestern Railway, described a similar scene hundreds of miles away southeast of Green Bay. Wire fences are a solid wall of ice stretching for miles on either side of the right-of-way. The ice was from 8 to 10 inches thick and covered the fence, wires, and posts like a heavy coating of silver paint. When the western sun shone on these fences yesterday afternoon, it was a sight I never expect to see again. They glinted and shimmered in the sun's rays and were a strange picture. A report from Madison about the ice zone said, Trees, even houses and buildings, are cloaked and have been since Wednesday with coatings of ice, which give the scene almost the picture of fairyland of childish imagination, and, were not, and if it were not for the fallen telegraph poles and trees marring the scene with debris, the ice prisms from the sunlight on them could be pictures of such beauty that one might also welcome the storm for the picture created. Lillian Case at Lawrence College described the scene to her parents. It is so beautiful and I never in my life imagined anything so perfectly wonderful from the standpoint of beauty. It is a perfect fairly, fairyland of loveliness and I cannot work, only just look. It would take weeks and months to repair all of the damage to power, telegraph, and telephone systems. Damage often had to be assessed on foot. Over 9,000 poles were estimated to be broken in the Fox River Valley alone. Repairs were hampered by lack of means of communication to the outside world and the inoperable railroad lines. But where there was a will, there was a way. 22 sleigh loads of poles were sent from Green Bay to Kakana and Kiwani by the Wisconsin Telephone Company. Farmers were solicited for their teams and rigs to help out. Thousands of men brought from far away as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Missouri were brought in to work on repairs of telephone and telegraph lines. The Capital Times reported, Many are housed and fed in cars, fitted up with beds, tables, billiards, etc. Salt barrels, sawed in two at an angle, and fitted with cushions make fine easy chairs. Many of the men are foreigners from Chicago, strange of garb and visage, Large numbers of them have adopted the practice of wearing gunny sacks tied over their shoes, giving them a grotesque appearance. Due to the weather conditions, repairs were often temporary. George Lutz reported, Between Reedsburg and Wyville, a distance of about 40 miles, the Northwestern Railroad has 500 men working, restringing wires, and all they can do is nail a plate to a fence and tack a wire on it until the ground thaws out. Eventually, telephone companies regulated by the State Railroad Commission had to make petitions to raise rates, often as much as double, for many months. Damage to the Wisconsin Telephone Company alone was estimated at $3 million, more than $50 million today. The death toll from the storm, while mercifully small, will probably never be fully known. People died in a variety of ways. In Boscobel, Judson Wright was apparently electrocuted when he went down into his flooded basement. In St. Paul, four people were reportedly killed, including one woman who was electrocuted using an electric iron when a surge came through the circuits after the wires were blown down. A Minneapolis man was drowned in a mill race, Another elderly man died while shoveling, and a third from exposure. A Chicago report, paper reported 12 people died by various means in Minnesota, possibly including the four just mentioned. A five-year-old boy drowned in Rockford when he fell into a flooded creek. The loss from the storm would be estimated in the millions. However, it would be months before it was fully known what the extent was and it was probably never really fully known. Some reports estimated the loss in Wisconsin between 15 to 20 and as high as 30 million dollars, which would be 
$250 million to $500 million today. Eventually the snow melted, new poles were put up, wires were restrung, communications and railroads were restored. It was the trees, however, that would tell the story for years and decades to come of the great ice storm of 1922. They would be the lasting reminder of that fateful day more than 100 years ago when the great ice storm of 1922 paralyzed Wisconsin and much of the upper Midwest.